Are you doing a documentary on Paul? I knew Paul as a high school debater at Detroit Central Catholic, and I recruited him to come be on the UK team. Paul went to the University of Kentucky on a debate scholarship. About 1980, I believe, 80, 81. He had a full scholarship, the UK being a good debate team, so it was obviously a good deal for him. Oh, I thought he was very talented and had a lot of potential as a college debater. I knew that he was a debater, um, and that was very evident. He was very used to making declarations, and so he would make a declaration. Collaboration is conflict because you have opposing, or if not opposing, at least different sets of ideas that um, engage in a, a confrontation and on separate points, one idea wins and one loses. You know, he's, believe it or not, kind of shy, and he was brought up in a Catholic school environment in days where I think they still believed in, like, corporal punishment. He's got a really high IQ. He's a really sharp guy. It takes what I would call a reflective mind, um, someone that's very good at seeing relationship among ideas that are similar but not the same. Paul was very good at developing creative arguments. Oh, well, the first mistake was mine. You hear human speech. We sort of expect that it's directed towards you, or you're somehow involved in it, God forbid. And that's the deal, isn't it? I mean, it's supposed to be. But nowadays, you don't know. Because look, what we see on the street today, cell phones, there's people talking to themselves, you can't tell. Are they talking on the phone? Are they talking to themselves? Are they nuts? What? And he was doing quite well. He was a very good debater and was doing well at tournaments. It was over two years I know he was in it. I think he just wanted just to, to spend all his energies on music. His music interest ultimately won out. He elected to go the other way. We had just gotten into the, you know, the punk scene, watching 60 Minutes, and they had a big thing on punk rock, and it was in 1977, and uh, they were throwing beer on each other and stuff on the TV, and we thought, man, those people are crazy, but it looks like fun. There was not that many bands in Lexington that were doing that. Everybody was unique and different. But I met Paul, and uh, one day he was playing with a band called Plastic Fangs. And I was just like enthralled with them. I thought it was amazing. Actually, I came up to him, and I'm like, where are you from, dude? And he's like, I'm from Detroit. I went to see the Plastic Fangs with Paul and Markle Tumlin and Del Pruitt. The next semester, I had a, a literature class with Markle. And at the time, Paul was uh, in New York City. Well, he wasn't from here, he's from Detroit. I, you know, he had no reason, he had no ties here, you know, except for going to school. So if he wasn't going to school,
When I met him, he was just passing through on his way, I don't know, to New York City or to Detroit or from one of those. He started flopping on my couch. And then he left for a while and then came back in the summer. And that's when we really, we started playing regularly. Eighty-five or eighty-six, when he had uh, he had his band called the Johnsons in Lexington. They were the Johnsons the first time I saw them. We show up and there's there's all these bands there, all these people there to see this Lexington showcase. I notice these two guys walk in. They've got on like long overcoats and gangster shoes and fedoras. Looked like George Raft and Paul Mooney just walked in. And I was thinking, you know, who are these guys? Go down to Lexington with a couple of bands from Cincinnati and we'd split gigs and that's how I met him. The big tall guy in the Johnsons. I mean he's really good. You know, just as a songwriter. Just, you know, and you know, in some ways more unique. There was something just so, you know, about his presence. So his guitar playing style, he was, well, that was when he was running the amp through the acoustic guitar. You know, it has the little switches on top of, you know, the hollow body. And, and there was something about that sound. I mean, I can talk all you want about what an innovator he was as a guitarist. Acoustic guitars and distortion and feedback and just that pure physical, you know, pushing of air with that acoustic guitar. The combination of mellow acoustic uh, kind of near young stuff that would switch to like really crazy rock. He and Tim had such a tight, shorthand kind of way of working with each other. Just very few words could communicate exactly what kind of tone and mood that they wanted for the song. Paul would stay home. Paul would write songs. Paul would arrange his next gig. You had to be pretty special to get Paul out of the house. All right, there you go, one more. I hope the house is still there. Oh, it is still there, but they put vinyl siding on it. Let's see if I can pull in here. I remember that stoop. In Paul's room it was in the back corner. I spent a lot of time in that room listening back to recordings that we had just worked on. Sometimes we would do vocals or isolated percussion and stuff in there. You know, you always hear from other people stories about him, you know, living in New York and sort of hustling his way through the streets of New York and, uh, you know, spending some time communing with uh, William S. Burroughs, uh, maybe Jaco Pastorius. There are stories about him. When I moved there, it was 1988. I moved there on my own, and then he drove the car up after. This was like Paul's second or third incarnation of life in New York. He would go over to Avenue D and score some junk. I don't think I really knew how bad the heroin situation got for him. 
He had been in New York, and he, he was filled with tales of how rough that was for him. is Paul Kay and the Weatherman by this time. I am not sure why they uh, changed the name. The Johnsons seemed to be working, and they were getting some name recognition as the Johnsons were releasing these wonderful cassette tapes. Perhaps Paul wanted something a little harder edge. Here, they're still the Johnsons, and they're playing with Active Ingredients, which is Lawrence Tarpey's uh, early and very well-loved project. This is Paul. It's his work here. Uh, a painful evening with Paul Kay and the Weathermen. And here you can see him saying that they'll be opening Friday for Dinosaur. We made that booking before Dinosaur had to change its name. The music was circulating really by word of mouth, by these paper zines and by gigs at uh, venues that would open and close in a matter of months. Two copies of this, just as you can see how every one was different. Some he would write that on there and some not. I think he took some where he would have nine of them and he drew a picture, maybe an eye of Horus. Right. That if you put it all together, you could have the big picture. So who knows where all those are? I don't think I've ever compiled a complete list. Every time I I think I've got it, you know, two or three more surface that I forgot. I used to be savage by nightmares, a terror I wore like a brand. These are the things that you made disappear, which is the wave of your hair. Dude, where's my city? <laughs> I thought he could probably find somebody who would be more into traveling and I had I don't know I had a family I, I just didn't feel like I was I could devote the time to it that he wanted but I think he found a more than adequate replacement in Glenn After I finished my senior recital and was done with a majority of my academic responsibilities, that I got to experience the town of Lexington and, and see a lot more of the bands. I saw Steve Poulton play several times with Lily Ponds. I first heard of Paul's music, talking with Steve, and so I picked up some of Paul's records. It resonated with me right off the bat and, uh, and, and loved it. So we're here to talk about Paul Kay. Remember Paul Kay? Hard to forget. Hard to forget. I go to see the band and they had Keenan Lawler playing bass. And, you know, Keenan is a brilliant musician. I was like, I'm gonna play bass in that band. I was cocky. I could, like, I could play. I played. I do that. They had already made a bunch of cassettes. You know, full length cassettes. Like, I don't know how many. You know, 20 or so. By the time I joined the band, you know, then they. We did six or seven more, and the Patriots record was out. Started playing some shows. You know, they were touring Europe, trips to New York and other cities, but I never met Paul when I was in Lexington, actually. And after graduation, moved back to Chicago. And shortly after that, got a call from Steve wondering if I'd be up for playing a show with Paul. Basically, baptism by fire, especially, you know, playing with Paul.
And I've been on stage playing with them when the moment hit. And uh, when it caught fire, and it's, you know, it's like a flamethrower. Well, we dated for five years, and I think we lived together for three years. He lived over on Lexington Avenue for a couple of years, and you know, I spent a lot of time over there. And we used to, after I would get off work at Cheapside, I would go meet him over there, and we would play cards, and he would play music for me, and I would drink beer, and he would drink bourbon. But we had a great time, and he was always funny, and mm -hmm. we had a lot to talk about. I got lots of curses. What year did you move into this place? I think it was 1994. So how long have you been dating when you It must have been two years. Okay. Was that a big decision to decide to move Yes, it was. You know, uh, something that I knew my parents weren't wild about. Now he had uh, the record deal with Alias. We got Maureen Tucker to produce our record. Uh, we, had, we had to have our shit together for this next record for what would be Love is a Gas. His ideal was, which was a great idea, to, you know, if he had to rehearse, he was going to do it in style and rent a houseboat for a week and be able to bring his girlfriend and, you know, make it something enjoyable. All the lives we lead are They are like We toured on Love is Gas quite a bit. We did go uh, to Europe, we toured the States with it, you know. Um, I think it had been out a while. He was actually, when I left the band, he was just getting ready to record A Wilderness of Mares. Paul was really looking like he was on the way. They were on an upswing. I believe they were getting incredible reviews out of Chicago. Absolutely great guitar player. Great on-stage presence. Fantastic poet with a rock and roll soul. He had it all, man. The record that really blew my mind would have to be Wilderness of Mirrors. The most enduring rock and roll legend, of course, dates all the way back to Robert Johnson, that everyone knows is going to the crossroads, right? If you're going to be a rock star, you go to the crossroads. You make a deal with the devil there. The devil sort of anoints you for the last little push, the last little magical powers that you need to be a success. He bestows those on you at the crossroads. <laughs> hell fans from prison cell from a day of torture, life in hell. Walking news brings the blues and the reds and the blacks and the purples. To me, getting to the crossroads means you put your music above everything else family, friends, your woman, you put them in their place so that you can get there. I think the line's been broken. One word is rarely spoken. He was primed, he was ready. God's love is only token. That's what makes the devil willing to show the up in the first place. Paul gets to the crossroads, he makes the deal. What is the devil going to say? The devil's going to say, gotcha, you just handed me your soul, and guess what? I'm the devil. Did you forget? I can't give people anything but hell. So welcome to it. Go and read your Greek mythology and Latin. The hero doesn't become a hero until he dies. One way or the other, he has to descend into the valley of death and return unscathed.
aren't all prophecies self-fulfilling? And don't we pretty much make our own luck and carve our own destiny without even really thinking about it? When we met up and started living together, I certainly didn't think what would happen to her would happen to her, and I didn't think what, what happened to me would happen to me. Really, it's your basic breakup album, but it's disguised as a rock opera, disguised as a film's trap, disguised as a science fiction story or a spy novel. I went out to California to record it right when Lee and I started dating. Of course, I'm totally unprepared with any questions, but this is the final interview for the film. Um, I didn't really, hadn't really planned it like that as being the final interview. I can't keep doing them, you know. Well, you had mentioned on the phone that you were done and you used the term sucking the last bit of blood from you or something? It's probably something like that, yeah. <laughs> because it's true. Well, um, how do you mean? Well, you asked me to tell you pretty much every detail of my life. It takes a lot out of you, you know? You haven't got anything left, and I haven't got anything left. And the other thing is, uh, there's a couple things left, big things, too, that we haven't really delved into too much. Let's do it now. Well, we're going to try different things. So go oh, ahead. Oh, OK. You've got exactly 16 minutes. Okay. You know how I was saying for a long time, nobody's gonna wanna watch a movie about me. They never heard of me. Who gives a fuck, right? Right? How many times have I said that on tape? Well, I'm starting to think that that's not right. I'm, I'm wrong about that. I think when all the details get aired, they're going to say, that's one fascinating motherfucker. How come I never heard of this guy before? I was never smart just clever and quick with a lie now the moment of what they call truth is about to arrive they woke him said help us clear this wreckage aside and that's when Alvin lost his mind. Why did you write your album that way in 1998? I told you this before, it was dictated to me by old man Van Zant from out of the blue, from out of the clouds. 
and like bang, 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 five or six songs just coursed through me like some sort of electrical field. And I wrote them all down in a flurry. And from those five, I had the plot line. And then the thing wrote itself. I mean, I didn't sit down and think it up. Anyway, it just turned out that the last couple of years have some similarities to that plot line, which is 12 years old. I told her, I'm going to record an opera. And she thought I was just bullshitting her. And I came back, and uh, that's, and then we moved in, I guess, about a year later. I'll tell you what, we've talked about, we even argued about the title. I thought you should call it Failure with Dignity. I will tell you this, as much of a failure as I feel about not making any of the groups ever become financially successful, it is nothing compared with the failure uh, of my relationship and my time that I spent with her. I've never failed in anything so badly as that one. Not even close. I was trying to write it like the Book of Job and throw in as much crazy modern shit as I could to throw people off the trail. Job is the Christ figure. He suffers the indignities and then he's saved. He rises to eternal life. One, two, three, four. Glad you could come. You'll like it here. One of these days, maybe within the next 10 years or so, you're going to have a good movie on your hands. I can't thank you enough for the level of interest for you to even do it. But if you don't finish it, boy, I will haunt you from the grave. You know? I will, too. Believe me, I will. And the grave is where I might be. Talk a little bit about the concept behind Wilderness and Mirrors, like what it's about. Most immediately, it's a breakup album, quite obviously. The circumstances of its creation are laid out in the liner notes, and you know about them as well. It's a breakup album. In the, in the few months preceding that recording, Lizzie split on me, and so did Glenn, and so did Steve. Obviously, it was motivated by being lonely and isolated and left behind by all these people that I loved. I don't know about your footage, but most of mine looks like shit. It's about loss. I need somebody to throw me a rope. He referred to the Wilderness of Mirrors as the record that Glenn and I foolishly refused to participate in. We were together for a while, but our relationship just started to dissolve. I can't be in that environment anymore. I have to, I have to move forward with my life. He started screaming at me about some shirt I'm wearing or something. He was drinking more. He was kind of unhappy. We were just fighting, you know? I told him to go fuck himself, and I, I walked home. I remember walking home with my bass feeling like, the whole weight of the world had been lifted off my shoulders, you know? So, it was a pretty profound feeling of isolation. And I already had this idea of writing a song cycle about some unlucky dude who's fucking his wife one night and the phone rings and he's a National Guardsman and they tell him he's got to go out to the highway to clean up this mess. Well, right, that was in 1997. Twelve years ago or whatever it was, right around the time I met Lee, I remember on our first date telling her that I was leaving to record an opera. Glad you could come. You'll like
like it here. And she didn't believe me. What's it been, two months? <laughs> Six weeks since Canada? Something like that. Go ahead. See the fruit on the ground here? The squirrels eat it. When the squirrels get done with it, then the rats eat it. Now walk into the house. Right. Well, the one point I wanted to revisit is why is conflict so necessary? What were you gonna say? Uh, hold on just a minute. Sorry about that. My view of it is that the word collaboration is really a polite, kind, sort of sensitive, modern way of uh, not having to use the word conflict. You meet somewhere in the middle. That's what a collaboration is. You, conflict is an essential part of it. In, in my view, it's not just an essential part, it's the exact same thing. And you have to accept that conflict is what's driving um, most of the universe. Some unlucky dude. And the phone rings. They tell him he's got to go out to the highway to clean up this mess. His name is Alvin Garen Brody. It's an anagram for alien body arriving. <laughs> I put a lot of work into that record and a lot of thought into it, too. There is just one thing in this whole world of which I can be sure. I love my wife and she loves me. It's honest, true, and pure. Tell each other stories We amplify our lies And try to make some sense And try to kill all our time Her eyes were moist, her smile was warm Her body felt like foam The telephone was ringing And they called me Say is there for 
and he goes out, and the mess is a wrecked alien spaceship uh, and a bunch of dead bodies, alien bodies, you know. That's the aliens who are crashing into the desert, and they're, they're prowling around up there. They're basically, they're patrolling Earth. Reconnoitering is the term. <laughs> And the one alien says, God, I wish we were back home on our planet. I miss my wife, et cetera, et cetera. The only good thing they got here on this fucking planet is filtered cigarettes. And uh, then they crash. One, two, three, four. That's a little device of my own design. It's a feedback loop. It makes an oscillator, and then you can use the volume knob or any other knob that's in the circuit, and you can alter the frequency so you can go is starting to not hurt so much anymore, which means I can maybe eat something in a little while. I put too many miles on the car, you know. I just burned my, my vehicle and treated it badly. <laughs> it's not a temple, it's a rental car. And when I turn mine back into the rental agency, I want it to not have Another mile on it. Not another inch left in the life of this thing, right? I want to run it to its fullest extent. The downside of that is you've got to deal with a broken rear view mirror, you know, a seat that doesn't stay in place, a coughing, a coughing um, fuel line. And so, so anyway, some of us have done that to our bodies. My stage fright gets worse and worse and worse as I get older and supposedly more experienced. I'd be nervous if I was playing inside a cardboard box and the audience was a, a colony of ants. I'd still be nervous as hell. I, I mean, I get nervous walking across the street to buy cigarettes, to be quite honest with you. Is that because you're very sensitive? No, it's because I'm paranoid and... I'm not too crazy about the world, and I'm pretty sure the world hates me. That makes you paranoid. Oh, if you plan to go outside, better keep your eyes open real, real wide. This trouble comes in deep disguise, and everybody's always switching sides. They say the world is a marketplace, so let the buyer beware They say the world is a lonely place But it's all between your ears
That's when he's being approached by various government agents, police, warning him to stay away. You don't feel smart and you don't feel strong And the road gets crooked and the days get long You weather that like any storm Just keep away, Jack, don't leave me alone They say the world is a marketplace So let the buyer beware Can you see what I'm looking at? No. Well, it should look like I'm getting done with something when I put it in my Yeah, go ahead. What does wilderness of mirrors mean? In an environment where Nothing presents a single fragment of truth. So, like a funhouse, nothing you see can be trusted. And the idea was actually this might at some point be made into a film. That was the hope for the idea. Yeah, it will when I'm dead. And these filmmakers that have talked to me about wilderness so far, they've got a lot of ideas, but they don't have any financial backing. And you can't make a movie with alien spaceships and shit unless you got some money to work with, right? I told them, shit, I can think of a lot of ways to lower the budget, but I can't think of any way to do it with zero budget. I mean, you could film the inside of an alien spaceship in a Lexus. If you did the set right, if you, you know, you black out the windows, you might have to use some computer generated background. Uh, but you could do it cheap, but you can't do it for free. You gotta get the Lexus somehow. Rent it. Oh, we can borrow a Lexus. And then the other thing that's probably worth mentioning, when I found myself bereft of band members, I, uh, forced this reunion with Tim Welsh, you know, who I hadn't played with in quite a long time. I guess he had a falling out with Steve and Glenn and called me up for, to do a Wilderness of Mirrors, which is just the two of us. I got him to take the assignment with no notice at all. And as I mentioned earlier, no rehearsal either. And he flew out to Los Angeles and we got down to business. We just immediately played perfectly together, it was fine. And, and we got good results. I spent about five days laying my parts down, and then he added the rest. That was it. I think that's your best record? I, I think it's far and away the best one, yeah. Although the most recent one is quite good. Well, it sounds to me like the wilderness of mirrors could also mean wilderness of meaning. Well, that is what it means, because um, each mirror is a, a fact, a reality, or an experience coming at you in life. You're not looking at the real object, you're looking at something reflected in that mirror. And each mirror is curved slightly, or cracked, or thickened, and so that the picture that you get is not accurate. And even more importantly than that, the picture you get is just a picture. And the way we live, the data that we base our decisions on is all distorted data. It's all mirror reflections. And all the mirrors are warped. So now you've not only got to gather all the data, but you've got to go and inspect all the mirrors and, and memorize what their curvature is so that you can correct for things that you see. You have to decode it decrypted. Everything is encrypted in the world. Everything that you learn, everything that you find out really actually means something else. 
And it could take 20 years to figure out what that something else is. What put her in the hospital again? Well, she's had cancer since the very beginning of the story. Perhaps caused by the alien ship. But in like the third song, he takes it to the doctor and the doctor rapes her. When he finishes and she comes out of her anesthesia, he said, oh, by the way, you got cancer. That's why she ends up there. All right, don't film, just listen. I really want you to hear this. I'm really proud of it. No thanks, Teddy, I'll take cash. Of course I'd take cash. Teddy never had a checking account in his life. I don't think so, Teddy. Somehow, I don't think so. Besides, I don't want a Cadillac. Everybody wants a Cadillac. Well, we gotta go sit in the bar and listen to the piano player before dinner. So 6.30 is pushing yeah. that even. Okay, well, we're not gonna listen to that guy for too long. Why don't you ask Lee some questions? Ask her about what an asshole I am and try to get her to just straight up tell the truth, because I don't care. Uh-huh. Well, are, is he putting words in your mouth, or...? Um, yeah, he, is, he can be an asshole, of course. It's probably why, you know, <coughs> anyone an asshole you stay with. But he's got good qualities. How long have you known Paul? Oh, God, I've known him for about, um, 15 years. We've been together about 10. Miles. No, I probably knew him about 20 years, actually. You guys don't get out that much? I don't like to go out, really, because I'm going to work and teach Pilates. I have a studio and have my mom to take care of. So, and Paul to take care of, which is quite a lot, you know. <laughs> mm. Is he easily upset? I mean... Yeah. She was damaged and fragile and, and that's why, right? couldn't see anybody else. It was, uh, okay, now, not this exit, but the one right after it, 18A, okay? I was talking to Dave Roth, I think it is, uh -huh. and Dave Roth was saying that Paul is actually a pretty, I think he may have used the word, gentle uh, person in, in, uh, underneath or something. He I'm, is, he is. And when you get that side, it's great, you know. He, I mean, he is. I love Paul. Don't get me yeah. wrong. She started having uh, neurological problems like balance, um, different things like this. I kind of wrote it off to drinking on an empty stomach, and I told her, you got to quit drinking, so she did. And she quit cigarettes, too. She was staggering when she walked, and her speech was badly slurred. When I went into the hospital, in Lee's mind, that meant I was leaving her for good. And she became absolutely hysterical. They wouldn't let her come to the hospital to visit me. She was like having these psychotic fits in the, in the visiting area. And, you know, so then I got out of the hospital and I was staying at Bradley's so I wouldn't have to climb the stairs and so I could get a breather. So I didn't want to go back to the apartment and start fighting with her again, you know. And I was out of the hospital for a week and then she got into this car wreck and was dead when they took her, when they got her to the hospital, she was dead. I miss her so badly, I can't even describe it.
truck is running pretty well, but it's old. That's probably why, of all our things, it never sold. My wife is holding up so far, but I feel that her symptoms will get worse within the year. And it's old. running around you don't know who to trust the doctor rapes your wife the guy that's supposed to heal you is actually hurting you
The doctor tells her uh, she has cancer after he gets done raping her. This is 41268. Hello? Hey, Paul. Johnny, this thing is fucking dying. I'm trying to get Lee's cell phone to call you back. Your phone's dying, you said? It's been dead for about an hour. Call you back on her cell phone. Just pick it up. How are you feeling? I got some shit to tell you. I mean, you know, first and foremost, I mean, I love Paul Kopaz. I, I truly love him. He's 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 a he's been a really interesting friend throughout the years. You know, I I tried to make clear how you know important. Paul has been to me, you know, and and uh, I think I said how he was always great to my wife and everything too. But um, you know, I'm not going to tell you how to make your movie. But I'm, if people are being brutally honest throughout, you know, definitely make sure you include some of that. That's what makes me sad is seeing like here. I thought when I was dating Paul that he was, you know, this scary, weird-looking guy, but he wasn't. I mean, he was attractive and charming and charismatic. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if it weren't for him. I wouldn't be able to appreciate books and art and movies and music. You know, I really kind of feel like I owe Paul a lot. Uh, he taught me a lot and exposed me to a lot and put me through a lot of, a lot of experiences. Um, like I said that, I don't think I'd be doing what I'm doing today. And, and, having the luck that I, that I have right now without those experiences. It, it kind of was, you know, uh, schooling for me, and I, and I do feel indebted to Paul for that. This note is without any purpose other than to tell you how much I love you. You made me happy for the first time in a very long time. Blah, 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 and it goes on about poetry and jazz and heroin and diamonds and all this stuff. But see, then he signs it, thanks for being my best friend. Because he is freaking brilliant. He's brilliant and I'm in love with him and I'll always be in love with him to the day I die, always. I think that I wish he didn't, you know, I wish he didn't drink as much as he drank. I'll just come and tell you, man. I, I, I think that, you know, it's going to kill him. And, uh, You know, that's pretty hard to, um, that's pretty hard for me to think about. Hello, what? I said I hate these things. Might have to go to the emergency room. When I was a little kid, I broke my arm. Um, a small bone inside the elbow, and they, fixed it and they wired it together and then they carved it open again and they took the wires out okay and ever since then it's been a 
night there. It's the size of a grapefruit, and I can't bend it. You know, this whole thing started with an alcoholic, incompetent doctor who fucked my elbow up when I was seven years old. And I got no reason to trust these guys, you know? If everything you've ever told us has been incorrect, why am I supposed to trust you now? The last doctor told me that any sort of um, especially opiate-based painkillers would make the problem worse. So I have to uh, sort of sit through it. But it kept flaring up and reoccurring. And so these things I've been having up here near the shoulder, I just figured the other, a couple of days ago I thought, oh man, this thing is so big and it hurts so much. Surely it's going to break open, you know? And then I won't have to go to the doctor. I'll save a hundred bucks, you know? Order a pizza or leave me the fuck alone. Okay. You ate. Okay, then go. Then go. Good. She panics and splits. She leaves her husband. She doesn't know how to deal with it. Only then does he start to go crazy. Hey, Al, I brought you some more new lies. And you won't be able to believe your eyes. The body you saw in that dirt. I'll just keep your mouth shut and you won't get hurt. They say the world is a marketplace. Well, let the buyer beware. They say the world is a lonely place. But it's all between your ears Now your wife is in New York At a comedy club called the Knife and Fork They say she's getting mighty sick If you want to go, you best move quick They say the world is a lonely place and up in your head But if you want to go up there Let the buyer beware You got questions or not? I was supposed to go to a show with me on a Sunday. It's actually Patty Griffin at Guitar Emporium. And you thought it was something else. Completely I different. I don't know what. And you didn't show up, didn't call, and I was like heartbroken. And then, like on a Wednesday, he shows up at my work with a cat candle. Black cat. And, you know, nice. And wanted to go out to dinner that life night. Life-size black. You know, it looked like Cat. miles, and it was yeah. like, um... With a wick sticking up out so of So excited, you know, head over heels, <laughs> couldn't wait, well, you know. What year would this have been? What, 87? No, no, not Six. 87. What's the matter with you? 97. 97. Or thereabouts. Yeah, 97. You guys had your 10-year anniversary this right, past? Right about now. Yeah. Is there like a anniversary date, or? you do anything special? Hell this no. is it right here. He goes out to dinner with me to Big Spring tonight. That's right. Be nice. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> a modern relationship, what shall do you we mean? say. Um, she was dead. There was no brain activity. There was no pulse. There was no oxygen to the brain for a period of anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes. We don't know. But she got, the oxygen supply to her brain got shut off. And it did serious damage. Serious fucking damage. That's about the time you called me. I think that was the day before Halloween. It was exactly the day before Halloween. The 30th of October. Around 1 o'clock in the afternoon.
to know how you're supposed to do it, but when I was growing up, you met up with different girls and sometimes you had to do dates. Do dates? Go on dates. Right. Right. And that was usually kind of problematic and it was always expensive. Sometimes you had to do it, sometimes not. Sometimes the girl would sleep with you anyway, sometimes not. Now, in this day and age, I don't know how it works. Nobody knows how you're supposed to do it nowadays, you know? Uh, you get the girl drunk? Do you get her an apartment? Do you buy her a car? Do you... What do you mean? I'm talking about people trying to make dates? human connection. No, dates is the oh. way they used to do it. I, what I don't kind know of human what you connection call it are now. you trying to make with me or with somebody else? Yeah, well, in this case, I'm talking about you. All right. But it could be anybody talking about anybody. But how do you do it? I, I don't know. How do you find an outlet for your love? How do you find a way? to let your love pour out of you. Because everybody has that in them. You know? A great deal of warmth and, but where do you go with it? Big bad city is making his way across the country to where he thinks she's probably going. He figures she's going east, either to Michigan or New York. All these things will get better, I told her. 
when we reach those city lights. We're gonna set the sights on the big bad city, and the city's gonna treat us right. Well, I know that there's more than one planet, and I know that time is tight. But I can't believe she headed to the city, she couldn't resist those lights. Okay, we're gonna keep on this point because it's pretty interesting and we're gonna I'm gonna change angles or I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Look back to where you were looking. Why concern yourself with all this? Doesn't it take a paranoic mind? Why not make it easier for yourself? Do you have a responsibility to to uh, to go in this direction? Do you have a choice? You could use the word responsibility. It's some kind of a biological imperative. It's just the way my mind works. I don't know. I just tend to dwell on it because I know that everything that I'm learning every day of my life is not the truth. You see. You learn one version of the truth when you're seven. You learn another one when you're 12. Another one when you get out of adolescence. You see what I'm saying? Is there a truth with a capital T? Well, probably not. But we can start by looking at these mirrors a little bit more closely. But you trace the path from one mirror to another, all these images ricocheting around. You can never find the, uh, you can never find the point of origin. You see, so maybe that the final truth is that there's no truth, that the point of origin is yet another mirror, you know, and you'll never be able to understand anything. And maybe that's the way things are set up because we're not gods. An unexpected smile can make a blessing from a curse. Try to get your reflection to look at the camera. Well, I guess there's both the other reflection to look at the camera. You know what I mean? Yeah, like that. <laughs> Maybe we should stop and do it again. Same spot? Mm hmm.
So how long were you in the hospital? Almost a month. All hell kind of broke loose. I've thrown up blood before, but this was something else entirely. It was the equivalent of about four of these, full. And it wasn't blood, it was dark brown, almost black. And I got really scared. It was coming from my spleen, my liver, my stomach, and the sores in my throat. My, my guess is it was a smorgasbord. They strapped my legs to the stretcher, and they started stretching my arms to me. He'll sleep for several hours. I went ballistic. I had been a perfect gentleman. That's when I started getting really paranoid. And then I got really angry and I started shouting out some shit. I had mentioned a science fiction movie or two, I don't know. They gave me something heavy duty to just put me out. You are not getting half what is coming to you. Shocking all I remember them people. telling the doctors they were all Nazis. I don't think that went over too well. I um, told all the nurses that they were Nazis too and they were constructing illegal experiments on people who hadn't done anything at all. I was ranting and raving. And they gave me something real heavy and I was out for a good day and a half. While I was out, one of their guys went to work and scraped the whole back of my throat out. Obviously, I don't remember any of that. He, there were too many sores to remove, and some of them were white, and he thought they might be cancerous, so he just took a bulldozer in there and just got rid of the whole thing. Want to talk about Lee? How she's going to be dealing with this whole well, thing? Well, every single friend and family member that talked to the doctors, they said, we've got to get him away from Lee. Her health problems are almost as bad as his, and they encourage each other. And uh, I, I got a sermon almost every day. Lee was supposed to stop by in the morning with the, my keys, and she didn't show up. This is the day. This is the day I'm getting out. I've been in there almost a month, and she couldn't make it. It's a lot more complicated than that, but I decided, you know what, they're right. I, I gotta get away from her for a while. Maybe, oh, here she is now. You better shut that off. Oh, I don't care, leave it on. Hello? Hi. Yep, I just came to get some underwear and socks like I told you I was gonna do, and I fixed the TV like I told you I was gonna do. All right? What? No, you didn't get to see me. I don't know you. Love you too. Bye. What do you, what's going to happen with you two? You want to try to... If she gets healthy, I'll go back there and live with her. If she doesn't, I don't know. I don't know what I'll do. Possibly, maybe it does me some good crying on somebody's shoulder, but I kind of run out of shoulders, so I'm going to try to keep that. Not talk about it too much. If there was some useful advice somebody could give me, I'm sure they would, but 
Some problems don't have solutions. It's a moral question that I can't solve. Go straight, you know. I'll drive myself crazy if I think about it all the time. But if I stop thinking about it, then I feel guilty because I'm not working on it. I'm trying to figure out an answer. I can explain it, try to contain it, trying to lose these useless fears. Straighten my back up, starting to crack up, wander alone through wounded years. Having a hard time drawing a straight line, no one can see how ill I am. Shaking a swelter, running for shelter, staggering like some homeless man. find her, I would remind her, all of the love we had was true, haunting a strange town, remembering how easy it was to care for you, if she would just go, both of us would know, nothing but death can kill the pain, guilty as Judas, heaven has screwed us, only the pure A lot of Lee's problems I either didn't notice or suppressed. I've never failed at anything so badly as that one. Not even close. How and what would you change if you could? Just be a better, more loving boyfriend all around. I would have forced us to get married. I would have forced her to change doctors and stop taking all the crap that those guys were giving her. Uh, I would have forced her to eat. But I don't. I, you know, I don't know, Jim. Yeah. Can always find things you could do better. possible if you could send all the source materials back to me. 
Come on, John. I'd like you to finish the film and everything, but I feel so badly betrayed that I don't really want to participate anymore. Oh, I've lost control. All my mistakes are in the mold. A statue forged in purest gold. A hand no one would want to hold. Stop the film, my eyes are red. The people in the crowd are dead. Just stop the film, my hands are numb. My thoughts are soaked in coke and rum. You know, you're the director. You should have worked all this out in advance. You shouldn't be running ideas by us in the middle of the fucking night. What do you want me to do? And I will do it and let us do it quickly. That's not unreasonable. Just tell me what you want me to do. Stop the film. This story's old. The moral was already told. I've done everything he's asked me to do, and I'm running out of gas. I don't know why that is so hard to understand, especially since I'm speaking it in English. Now, you don't have a story arc, and you don't, you're waiting for me to die, is what I think. And you shouldn't probably have to wait that much longer.
The whole problem is, in the modern world, when we're enveloped in a, like a, a grid, really, of electronic communications, how come we can't communicate with each other? You can We're communicate. Practically wrapped in a wire mesh okay. of communications. No. And yet, we have a very, very difficult time making a connection with one, of other, with one another. Yeah, you can. That's what I was talking about. Lee, you disagree? Yeah? Well, okay. I, I kind of disagree. You've got all kinds of friends that you talk to? No, I don't. I don't have time for much of anything right now. You know? Um, <coughs> friends, I wish I did. Well, I but talk to a lot of people. I use I the phone. I don't the use phone. the computer. I Talks use the phone. phone a lot. Because I think direct human communications are extremely important. And that's what I do. But we live in a world where it's very difficult to do it. Someday soon it may be impossible to do it. And you'll be able to email somebody, but you won't be able to hold their hand or look at them, smile. I mean, it's bad, it's bad. So anyway, I do what I do. There's a room to learn In my shaky voice Whether something's true It's really one more choice And we choose what we see what we hear when love's tender forces draw near there's a have any channels to talk about things on a really human level like face to face me to you the back fence the front porch the bowling alley you know the, the neighborhood tavern which is where I apply my trade by the way but at the same time the I mean this, this camera's pointing at you guys and you guys are telling your story into the camera and if it wasn't for the camera there right. would be no record of the story no, there, there would still be a record of the story. <laughs> I've made really? 55 albums, man. Well, this story right here, this intimate moment we're sharing, the three of us intimate together. Moment. There's a story still In our fractured lives Played each night inside a million smoke-filled eyes And we learn that our feelings aren't all just lies And that stories only come from the sky Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. It's not, it's... No. Takes a lot, you know, I don't know. It takes something. Courage. You probably have the alien thing, the ending, which has never been clear to anybody. 
to be. He's in the hospital going crazy, and she's in the next room over on the top floor dying. What happens is the spaceship comes and rescues them both, lands on the roof. So the alien could perhaps be the person that sings the last song there. It starts out, there's a will to live in your sleepy eyes or something. Nobody died. I don't think. I'd have to go back and listen to it. All I can do is make up stories. I have no way of knowing anything about it. I've heard so many stories. I was found in a cardboard box on the doorstep of the Carmelite Sisters home in downtown Detroit. That's the that's my favorite story. You weren't told anything. I was told 12 different things, so nothing was believable. You know? you change anything, then it's gonna, I'm gonna be a different person, and I don't know, I, I only know how to be this one. It's not to say I'm the best person I could possibly be, but this is the one that turned out, and this is the only one I know how to play. I sure would like to know, though. I would like to know. But it's just not gonna happen. Would you say that I that's... I bet you the woman was good looking, though. <laughs> when you said goodbye, you weren't very kind. And I cried, and then you realized you had been unwise. I lied when I said I was happy. I guess that it was a so small. Will it keep on pumping your artificial? still standing. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There'll be the time
Let's go next door. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. shut that off.